hearing titled Crisis in the Golden State, Citrus Psyllid and the Threat to Destroy California Citrus. California leads the nation in egg productivity where the farm gate value for agricultural products is $53.5 billion. Despite this growing market, California is consistently faced with the challenges that we must overcome, such as the introduction of deadly pests and the diseases that threaten our valuable crops and disrupt local economies. Today's hearing focuses on one particular pest, and that is the Asian citrus psyllid and the disease that it carries, Huang Long Bing. Asian citrus psyllid and Huang Long Bing have been detected in multiple counties throughout the state, requiring emergency quarantines in both ag and residential areas. And more importantly, Huang Long Bing has been detected in multiple trees in the LA basin, fearing, fueling fears that HLB will continue to spread with the growing Asian citrus psyllid population that we have here in the state. The challenge to stop Asian citrus psyllid from spreading can only be addressed through local, state, and national collaboration and communication. We have witnessed the massive devastation of Florida's citrus industry where the Asian citrus psyllid was first found in 1998. And within two years, half of the industry was decimated. There have been detections of Wan Long Big in every citrus producing county in Florida, costing $7.8 billion and nearly 8,000 jobs. California cannot afford to sustain this problem and the similar damages, so we must work together to find a sustainable way to manage and control this pest and protect our citrus trees. Today's hearing will provide a thorough examination of the multiple Asian citrus psyllid and Huang Long Bing finds in California and bring to light any further needs or support that can be provided to eradicate this effort. With that, I would like to invite our first panel to come forward. With us, we have Alyssa Houtby with California Citrus Mutual and David Roth, president of Cecilia Packing Corporation. And I would also like to thank our first witness, Andrew Meadows, who is being Skyped in with us today from Florida Citrus Mutual. Welcome, Andrew, and thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Good morning to the committee. I appreciate this opportunity to testify. Uh, again, my name is Andrew Meadows. I'm Director of Communications for Florida Citrus Mutual. We are Florida's largest trade organization representing about 6,000 growers. Um, as uh, the original speaker mentioned, uh, we first found the Asian citrus psyllid in 1998 and did not detect the actual disease HLB until 2005. So there was a seven year lag period. Um, at the time, a lot of our growers and industry were in denial. Uh, we were just coming out of uh, a major battle with citrus canker. Uh, we were all fatigued about that and really didn't have the energy to deal with a new disease. Well, here we are 11 years later. Um, our production is down to about 76 million boxes of oranges, um, 10 million boxes of grapefruit, and 2 million boxes of specialty citrus. Uh, that compares about 12 years ago, we had a record orange crop of 242 million boxes. So we have had a significant decrease in production. Uh, 12 years ago when we produced that record orange crop, we covered about 850,000 acres. Uh, we're down to 500,000 acres now. Um, some of that decrease can be attributed to the hurricanes, uh, again, canker, development in Florida and development pressure, uh, but certainly a significant amount is uh, due to HLB and uh, the, the devastation that it causes. Uh, some estimates uh, have pegged the losses at $4 billion and 8,000 jobs. That's a bit of a dated uh, report, so uh, all assumptions would point to that, those figures being higher. Um, right now, growers are, are fighting. Uh, it's, it's expensive to fight HLB. Um, back before the disease hit, it cost about $500 an acre to grow citrus in Florida. That number with all of the inputs, uh, the fertilizers, the chemicals is shot up to about $2,000 an acre uh, now. Um, when 
we finally got out of our denial phase here in Florida. We, we summoned the National Academy of the Science, Sciences and asked them, what can we do? Um, so they're some of the foremost agricultural scientists in the nation. Uh, one of their primary recommendations was to form uh, uh, entities called Citrus Health Management Areas, or CHEMAs, where growers cooperatively work together to fight the psyllid, uh, spray rates, timing, what chemicals they use to, to uh, uh, avoid resistance. These CHEMAs have given us some success. Uh, psyllid counts were down. Uh, they, recently, they've been up for a variety of reasons, but CHEMAs have really helped us out and, and growers working together, uh, former competitors and colleagues uh, getting on the same page with each, each other was really a groundbreaking occurrence here in Florida and has helped us survive the last 12 years. We've also had some success with heat treatment uh, where you actually heat up the tree uh, to knock back the bacteria. We have steam doing that. We have tents doing that. That's shown a moderate amount of success. Uh, some growers have found that they, they can, the trees can rebound if they uh, look at their water quality and use better quality water on the trees. Um, so we're having a little bit of success, uh, but again, it's an extremely challenging time. Uh, the trees are stressed. Uh, they're fighting. Uh, if you recall, uh, HLB attacks the vascular system of a tree so it can't uptake nutrients. It's basically starving itself when it dies. Uh, so now we're seeing a new uh, fungal disease called post-bloom fruit drop uh, all over the state. It's not a new disease, but now because the trees are stressed, it's causing major problems for our growers. And you'll, if you ride around the citrus areas, you'll see basically uh, uh, post-bloom fruit, which is the small fruit, the, the tiny pea-sized and golf ball-sized fruit, dropping off the trees, and that's next year's crop. So we're very, very concerned about next year's crop at this point in time. Abandoned groves are another major concern here in Florida. These are groves that were either bought for development that never got off the ground after the real estate bubble, or growers have just walked away. Um, there's still trees in the ground providing feeding grounds for the psyllid. Uh, reservoirs of the disease, if you will. We've got 130,000 acres of abandoned groves. If you remember, I said we have 500,000 acres of producing groves, so that's almost 20% are, are abandoned, serving as breeding grounds for the psyllid. Um, and we've been struggling with this problem for quite some time. We have been able to remove some of those groves, um, but because ownership is all over the place and, and uh, you know, everybody has uh, different plans for their property. It's been, it's been tough to get those trees out, but we are working on it, uh, both with our state and federal regulators. Um, the good news in all of this is that our state and federal officials and regulators have been absolutely lockstep with us in this fight. Um, on the state level, our legislature, uh, Senate leaders, House leaders, our Commissioner of Agriculture, Adam Putnam, um, have been terrific. Uh, they understand the importance of our industry to the state of Florida, uh, particularly the interior, the rural communities across Florida. Um, they've appropriated just in research funding $20 million over the last five years to go directly to citrus research to beat this disease. Uh, just eight million this last section, uh, session in 2016. Uh, so again, uh, I can't say enough about our state legislature and what, what they've uh, stepped up to the plate for the Florida citrus grower. Uh, on the federal level, our congressional delegation has been tremendous. Uh, uh, two years ago, they helped pass the Farm Bill, uh, which included five years and $125 million in funding for citrus research. Uh, we're in year two right now of that funding. Uh, that is uh, funded disease research, everything from bactericides to genetic engineering to RNAi to the heat treatment I mentioned before. Um, that has been uh, a godsend for our industry and has helped fuel really a, a, uh, a Manhattan Project type uh, funding uh, program for us. And uh, it certainly has been a shotgun approach. We're looking at everything 
uh, right now that, that can possibly affect that psyllid uh, as well as the bacteria. Um, you probably know, uh, I know we've been working with uh, California Citrus Mutual on an effort to uh, tweak the IRS code right now to stimulate replantings. Um, you know, we need to get more trees in the ground. We've lost dozens of packing houses. We've lost processing capacity. And just a side note, our industry is about 95% of our oranges go to juice. Tropicana, Minute Maid, Florida's Natural. California, as you know, is, is, is primarily a, a fresh fruit uh, industry with the majority of your fruit going to uh, uh, the fresh market. But we, uh, we, are, we are looking to get more trees in the ground. We've got to, we've got to support that infrastructure. Uh, this IRS tweak would allow growers to expense the cost of replantings immediately. Um, and we'd like to get 20 million trees in the ground over the next 10 years, again, to support that infrastructure up and down the interior of Florida. Again, I mentioned the research. Uh, we've got the best minds at the University of Florida, uh, the USDA. I know your research institutions in California are working extremely hard on this, this uh, problem as well. Um, I always joke that if you're a citrus researcher and you're not funded right now, you probably need to get in another profession because uh, we, we have appropriated and, and granted a lot of funds right now and, and have had some success, as I mentioned before. Um, growers themselves, I mentioned the federal and state funding. I know uh, California has a research assessment for growers. Florida growers have committed over $100 million over the last 10 years. That's money that would previously have gone toward marketing our products. But uh, the decision was made that uh, if we don't beat this disease, we're not going to have a product to market. So um, we need to put that money towards research. So they've got significant skin in the game. Um, in closing, I know I have about 10 minutes and I'm getting close. Um, but there is, you know, I've, I've outlined a lot of uh, doomsday scenarios here, and it is very challenging. But there is optimism out there. I mean, our growers are extremely resilient. They're multi-generational families, fourth and fifth generation growers who are all in right now. Um, you know, we beat hurricanes, we, we beat other diseases. Uh, of course, you probably remember the freezes of the 80s, some of you, which devastated Florida's industry. We came through that. Um, we're we're going to come through this. You know, we still represent a $10 billion economic industry. Every year we, we contribute $10 billion to the state's economy. We still support 62,000 jobs. Um, all of the communities down the interior of the state, the Sebrings, the Lake Placids, the Lake Whales, uh, they, they rely on citrus. And, and you can't find somebody whose citrus doesn't touch in those communities and they're relying on our leaders and our researchers and our growers to, to find solutions. And uh, I'm confident we will. I'm confident that we're going to have a future, and, but it's certainly going to take a partnership between state, the federal uh, officials, as well as regulators to get this done. But uh, we're going to get there. And uh, again, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Um, I had a couple of questions for you. You talked about the success with the heat treatment using steam and tents. Can you yes. tell us a little bit more about that, how that works, and, and the sure, time and, sure. and the you, cost Sure, sure. You actually, um, th there are prototypes out there, and there are, there, it's actually formed sort of a cottage industry right now of, of uh, tents or, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of a canvas cover that is put over the trees. Uh, some of the prototypes use steam to actually heat the tree up with the steam. Some just use the solar power to heat up the tree and, and put a tent that covers maybe four trees at a time. Now that won't kill the bacteria, but it will knock it down and uh, allow that phloem to take those nutrients up to the tree. So it's another tool in the toolbox. It's not a silver bullet, but in combination with the other uh, uh, inputs and solutions I mentioned, you can you can grow a crop right now, but it is tough. Um, it, it is, it's not a long term. We don't have a lot of data on it, but anecdotally, it's showing trees are 
uh, responding to it well, and it's another tool. So when you have, when you're using the canvas covers and the steam treatment or the solar, is it that you have to permanently keep the trees covered in that way, or what's the time frame, or is it unknown? Uh, it's, it, you, you do it twice a year, and you heat it up to, I'm not sure what, the, I think it's 120 degrees for uh, four hours, and then you treat it later in the year. So it's once every six months. You don't have to keep the, 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 the tree under the heat. You, you heat it up and then you take it off and the tree responds to that and then you get it uh, in six months again. So no, it's not, it's not a consistent heat. Is there any sense of how, how long this treatment every two years can keep these trees alive? And how long has it worked at this point in time? Right, right. We we don't have enough data on it. It's still, I don't want to call it experimental because it is being used uh, fairly widely, uh, but we're still looking for year-over-year -year data. As you know, collecting data on, on this type of research takes several years, but anecdotally, uh, we, we are seeing that the trees are responding. The flush, the new growth is better better leaves, uh, better yields on the trees, um, but it is still in the, quote, experimental process. We don't have a lot of year-over-year -year data at this point. Thank okay. you. <clears throat> yeah, I've got a question. How, yes, how much How much per acre does this cost, and uh, who's, what burden does it cost go to the grower? Is the state putting in any money, feds putting in any money? I mean, it's gonna be an astronomical cost to be able to treat a thousand acres of citrus. Uh, in general, it's it's costing us about two thousand dollars an acre to grow citrus right now. That's uh, full blown management. Uh, that's a mint program. Uh, again, ten years ago, that was five hundred dollars an acre. So um, we are not getting direct funding from the state or the federal government to to uh, uh, fund production, but as I mentioned, we have garnered significant research dollars, uh, support dollars at the state level. Um, so I guess it's all, if you look at it as all one pie of money, that certainly helps uh, money that otherwise the grower would have to put up. But no, we're not getting direct uh, production grants or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of this witness? Okay. Thank you very, very much. That was very insightful, and, and you mentioned some things that I know that I have not heard of up to this point, so um, I really appreciate your testimony. Thank you, and, and Anne has my contact information if, if there are any follow-up questions, certainly. Thank you. And our next witness is Alyssa Houtby, Director of Public Affairs with California Citrus Mutual. Thank Good morning. You, Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, this morning, I'm, I'm grateful you had the opportunity to hear from Andrew first about what the experience has been in Florida with regards to the Asian citrus psyllid and Wong Long being. I myself had the opportunity to travel to Florida earlier this year, and let me tell you, until you've seen it firsthand, it's, you can't fathom the destruction that this disease has um, resulted in. In Florida, there's whole communities that um, are almost like ghost towns now. And as part of my trip to Florida, I, I worked with a film crew on a documentary that we're going to show you now. And this just gives you a taste of, of what the Florida grower is going through right now. And I have to say, I, I was impressed and encouraged by their optimism. They are true farmers. They are not giving up. But uh, nevertheless, this has been extremely uh, damaging to their industry as a whole. So um, we'll get that video played for you right now. Since the onset of the disease, uh, we've gone from almost 242 million boxes in, in the state of Florida to now less than 70 million boxes. It's a dramatic change. My name is Kyle Story. I'm a fourth generation citrus grower from Central Florida. The first signs of, of HLB are greening. Uh, that we found was in 2005. 
uh, we thought they were a nutritional deficiency in the tree. And we know now uh, that that was the first signs of HLB. Our first reaction was to uh, immediately adhere to the advice of, of certified crop advisors, of the folks that we trust, and, and they advised us to spray for psyllids. Looking back on it, it was one of the wisest decisions we made. Ten years ago, I'd tell you I wasn't a farmer. Today, what we do in Florida to raise citrus is farming. Chimas are citrus health management areas. On a voluntary basis, you're trying to control psyllids on a much larger level. And 100% participation in those area-wide spray programs, those chimas, is essential to psyllid control. We were very concerned for a long time here in Florida about what your next door neighbor was doing and, and the term bad neighbor. We should have been more concerned about our neighborhood. Neighboring groves that are abandoned are, are very problematic for the industry. I'm Mark Wheeler. I'm a, a fourth generation citrus grower and uh, fifth generation agriculturalist here in central Florida. We discovered uh, HLB in our own groves back in uh, probably late 2008, early 2009. We felt like the infection was relatively low, but we knew it was coming and we were aggressive about pushing out trees at that point in time. We found early on that if you were spraying a block and your neighbor wasn't at the same time, well, the psyllids just moved from your block to theirs. And then a week later when he sprayed his, the psyllids came back to yours. We haven't been battling the disease long enough to know what an average tree age would be. We you know, were able to, uh, to treat the, uh, the younger trees uh, with, um, uh, with a drench for the uh, psyllid for the first couple of years. And where we'll shake out at, it's hard to know, but uh, you know, we're shooting for 15 to 20 years. And we're planting, most growers are planting a little higher density these days because in the trees that were planted by my grandfather, they were expected to live you know, 60, 80 years and be productive all through that life. But uh, unfortunately, I don't think that's gonna be the case going forward. There's a lot of folks in the industry who maintain that the small producer won't survive. And I personally think it's, it's the engaged producer is gonna be the one who survived. We're in a different reality and we have to embrace that. We have the world's most brilliant minds and scientists working on this disease. We've secured almost $200 million in funding for this research. And we feel that, that with all that brain power and with all those resources, with all the grower initiative that we see in each and every field, uh, we're gonna have to be successful. My biggest advice for, for California and their citrus industry is to be vigilant about psyllid control. Uh, we've, we now know that the psyllids can, can fly up to four miles in a 24 hour period. They can fly as high as three story building. And as far as you know, combating the disease, our you know, advice to producers in California would just psyllid suppression, you know, visit with your neighbors, you know, set up a chima and, and uh, you know, scout and, and know where the psyllid is and, and you know, just accept the fact that you know, you're probably going to have the disease if you don't have it already. And the quicker you can hop on psyllid suppression, the better position you'll be in. 20 years ago, we were oversupplying our market. And you didn't want to help your fellow grower. And so you wouldn't openly share with them your growing practices of what you were doing right or wrong. Uh, today, we're an open book. It's OK to make a mistake, but I made it for you. I hope one day to get back to the point where I don't want to share. Uh, that, that'll mean that we got to the other side. And so if you have the opportunity to, to protect your neighborhood, sit down, talk with your fellow grower about the importance of psyllid control and the cost effectiveness of it down the road. It's, it's vital to the future. Thank you. You see, uh, the landscape in Florida has changed significantly since the onset of this disease, and I fear that that is what California will look like if we don't act now to protect our citrus trees. So again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak 
before you today and for uh, your interest in this subject and bringing the issue up to the legislature um, as a whole. Um, HLB is a certain death sentence for California citrus trees and our citrus, in citrus industry if it is allowed to spread. Despite millions of public and privately funded research, there remains no cure for the disease, which means our best defense against, the Asia, against HLB is to prevent further spread of the Asian citrus psyllid. Citrus industries around the world are in crisis. In Mexico, every citrus producing state is infected with HLB. In Brazil, over 65 million trees have been removed due to this disease. In the United States, 90% of Florida's citrus groves are infected and the disease has spread to Texas, Louisiana, and now California. And it's been less than a decade, 2008, since the first Asian citrus psyllid was discovered in California. And today there are quarantines in place for the psyllid in all or portions of 21 counties. Despite our efforts, ACP is now endemic in Southern California and continues to move north along the Central Coast and into the Central Valley. Last fall, ACP populations exploded in Kern County and we're hearing of new finds in Tulare County, which is the largest citrus producing county, um, almost weekly. In 2012, the industry's worst fears were realized when HLB was discovered for the first time in a backyard citrus tree in Hacienda Heights. More recently, 20 trees were discovered to have the disease in San Gabriel, and it's generally assumed that there are more positive trees in that area. But early on, the industry realized that a proactive and comprehensive approach would be necessary to stop HLB from devastating our industry as it had and continues to do in Florida. In 2009, the industry worked to pass Assembly Bill 281, which created the Citrus Pest and Disease Prevention Program within CDFA and authorized a mandatory assessment on growers. The industry now raises approximately $15 or $15 million per year for residential and urban trapping treatments, biological control releases, and survey work to control the spread of the psyllid. The program also receives federal funding of approximately $10 million per year. However, the scope of this issue is increasing at a rapid pace and additional resources are necessary to maintain the program's effectiveness. Citrus growers are currently paying the maximum allowable assessment, but it's not enough. Our 2015-16 budget for the program is $17.6 million. However, the projected revenue from assessments is only $16 million. Currently, the industry is sponsoring a bill, Senate Bill 822, to increase the grower assessment cap from $0.09 cents per 40-pound carton to $0.12 cents per carton. Based on current production levels, this could result up to a $5 million increase in funding from the industry alone. Over 75% of these funds go directly to urban areas for the survey work, for trapping, and for residential treatments. Commercial efforts and the cost of complying with uh, quarantine regulations fall directly on the grower on top of this assessment fee. Psyllid control is the industry's biggest priority. Growers are currently operating under regional area-wide management strategies in which all growers in a defined area coordinate management efforts to maximize the impact on psyllid populations. Furthermore, current regulation requires that growers farming within a quarantine area to take specific mitigation steps before moving bulk citrus loads out of that quarantine area to be packed in a commercial packing house. A growing challenge, however, that we're facing now in regards to psyllid control is the willingness of homeowners to allow CDFA to treat their backyard trees. By and large, homeowner cooperation has been positive, but there are some areas where homeowners are opting out, opting out of treatments at an increasing rate. A common reason given is concern about pesticides. I fear that the misperceptions around pesticides and their impact to pollinators specifically are directly influencing their decisions uh, not to treat their trees. And here in California, we have more citrus trees in backyards than we do in commercial production. So the industry is spending nearly $1 million per year to educate homeowners about the issue and about what they can do to protect their trees. If we lose the battle in backyards, we will lose this battle overall and we will lose our citrus industry. I would be remiss not to mention that this program is truly a cooperative partnership between industry, state, federal, and county governments, the universities, and of course, the general public. None of the countries or states I mentioned earlier have such a robust, robust partnership that includes direct outreach to homeowners. In our view, this partnership must continue in, 
in order to prevent HLB from taking hold. In closing, I want to reiterate that the industry's approach to ACP and HLB has always been a proactive one. When talking about this disease, we often refer back to what has taken place in Florida. In one sense, California has the benefit of time that Florida did not. However, the Florida industry has managed to limp along for over a decade with near total infection. But I assure you that California citrus will not survive with HLB as long as the Florida industry has. We are a fresh market industry. In fact, we produce 85% of the nation's fresh citrus supply, whereas Florida is primarily a juice market. So that affords them a little flexibility in the, the quality of the fruit that they send to market. We don't have that flexibility here in California. Uh, so from our perspective, we do not have the benefit of time that Florida um, also did not have. We all remain optimistic that science will deliver a solution, but at this point, science is not keeping up with the urgency of the situation. We are in crisis mode now and will take every action necessary with the support of our partners to save California citrus. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Okay. So if a homeowner doesn't want to allow CDFA to come in and mm -hmm. treat their tree, right. what happens if the homeowner just says, you know, this is beyond me, I don't know how to deal with it, I don't want to have to deal with it, mm -hmm. I just want the tree gone. Is there funding to take the tree out? As a, a private industry, we're partnering with Bayer Crop Science to offer that option to homeowners. Uh, they can request that their tree be removed, and we're looking into another program to, in the San Gabriel area specifically uh, to get those uh, highly likely positive trees out of the ground as soon as possible. In areas where there is not HLB, I'm thinking specifically along the central coast, um, where there are populations of the Asian citrus psyllid in close proximity to commercial uh, groves, there's, a lot, there's a, a lot of people opting out of treatments, and they're opting out because they're afraid that the pesticides that CDFA um, is applying will impact pollinator health. Now, we know that the, the science uh, does not su suggest that that is fact, and the manner in which these products are applied are per the label requirements and very safe and effective against the Asian citrus psyllid. But it's common misperception that these pesticides are harmful to pollinators, and that um, has directly caused an increase in opt-outs, which will jeopardize the efficacy of our program if that, that number of opt-outs continues to grow. So are very many homeowners opting to to go ahead and remove the trees, and is that We're happening? We're seeing a, a slow interest into it. We haven't um, promoted it for very long, and honestly, people love their citrus trees, so sure. it's a hard sell to ask them to take them out, and it's not one that we really want to have to sell, um, but if they're not willing to treat, our only option really is to ask them to take them the trees out of the ground. Now, there's some organic options that I'm sure uh, the panelists that um, are going to be speaking today can, can mention, um, 